Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans and you're watching the John Cedars channel from The Bunker. And in this video, I'm going to be going through my 10 worst videos that were put out by Jehovah's Witnesses in 2019. Now there's some pretty awful stuff that I wanted to show you. So without further ado, let's roll the first clip. That the governing body will continue to do everything in our power to provide the needed relief aid to our dear brothers in these affected areas. We love you very much and thank you for tuning in for this update. I wish we this could help. Me too. Oh, I have an idea. What is it, sweetie? Can I give this to our brothers affected by the hurricane? Of course you can. We'll put it in the contribution box on Sunday. My piggy bank was empty. I guess I can't help. There are many things you can do to help. First, you can save some money for next time. Second, you can think about them and pray for them. You know, Jesus felt the same way when he was here on earth. Do you remember what he said when he helped the leper? I want to! Yes, he did what he could to help others. Just like you. That makes us very proud of you. Now hopefully I don't need to explain why all of this is very inappropriate and distasteful. But there are two major issues that jump out at me personally. One being the complete lack of transparency by Watchtower when it comes to how it manages its finances. So in this particular 2019 video, children are being told that when there is a disaster, in this case a hurricane, the thing to do is give money to Watchtower and Watchtower will take care of things. But what Watchtower actually asks witnesses to do when there is a natural disaster is rather than giving funds to a dedicated fund where there's full transparency and every last cent goes towards the affected believers and you can have a whole other discussion about why it's only believers or predominantly believers who benefit. Rather than putting the funds in, a, in an allocated fund that's specifically for that particular disaster, Watchtower essentially uses these disasters as an excuse f to ask witnesses to donate more to them so that all of the money goes in Watchtower's worldwide work fund. And once it's in that fund, it could be used for more or less anything. It could be used, ironically, to prop up Watchtower's appalling uh, policies when it comes to child safeguarding which directly endanger children so then you have the irony of Caleb and Sophia donating to these policies that are putting them in danger donating towards for example lawsuit settlements and fines that Watchtower is having to fend off if all the money's going in one central fund how can you possibly justify manipulating children to think that when a specific disaster occurs, they need to give their money and they can have confidence that it will, that every last cent that they give will be spent on that disaster when that is simply not how it works. Of course, the second and most obvious problem with this video is that it's manipulating children to give money to a religious organization and especially when you consider this video in light of Bottlegate which happened in 2019 so right at the end of March governing body member Tony Morris was filmed inside a liquor store 
apparently spending large sums of money on very expensive single malt, why wasn't he giving his ice cream money to Watchtower? Why was he instead spending quite lavishly on very expensive alcohol? There's clear hypocrisy. I mean, there were people complaining, by the way, about the Bottlegate video, saying, oh, you know, who are we to judge? You know, he, he may be, I don't know, a leader of millions of followers, but he has every right to spend his money on what he wants to spend it on. Well, first of all, there's the fact that he is a Bethelite, and Bethelites take a vow of poverty. So how is he able to spend hundreds of dollars, I think it was $850 we worked out, on just about a dozen bottles of whiskey? What's the justification there? And also, is it not hypocritical? Because Tony Morris is on the teaching committee, and the teaching committee is responsible for creating and approving these videos. Is there not clear hypocrisy in this man creating a video or multiple videos coercing children to empty their piggy banks or give their ice cream money to Watchtower when he's able to freely lavish funds, it seems, on expensive alcohol when it suits him? So either way, there's hypocrisy and either way, it's extremely inappropriate for Watchtower to be creating cartoons that manipulate children to give them money. Let's talk about a type of speech that may be more subtle, more insidious, but nevertheless is very harmful. What is it? Murmuring. Uh, let's discuss avoid murmuring. Of course, now, murmuring permeates Satan's world. Children murmur against their parents. Wives murmur against their husbands. Uh, employees murmur against their employers. Multitudes murmur against God. Okay. Jude 16 speaks of murmurers complaining about their lot in life. And it's true, the more uh, a person complains about his lot in life, then the deeper the discontent becomes in his own heart. And since murmurers never keep their complaints to themselves, it sows discontent in others, see. And if you think about this, who was the original promoter of discontent with one's lot in life? Satan the devil. He succeeded in sowing discontent in Eve's heart. So uh, a murmurer is actually imitating the methods of the devil. And apparently a murmurer reminds Jehovah of his arch enemy, Satan. And that's certainly something no wise person wants to do, remind Jehovah of Satan. So we've discussed that murmuring breeds discontent, incites hatred, manifests pride. No wonder Jehovah hates it. But as we said, if we cultivate contentment, love, and we cultivate humility, these will serve as antidotes to our ever-becoming murmurers, and we'll be successful in applying Philippians 2.14, which says, keep doing all things free from murmurings. The coercion here is just blatant. You have here a leader of a religion numbering millions, essentially telling them that they don't get to complain, ever. They should just be content all the time, no matter what happens, no matter what's said, whether it's elders, whether it's new teachings, new lights, new policies coming down from the faithful slave, you can only be happy about it. If by any chance you're not happy about it, first of all, that's your problem. And second of all, you need to keep quiet. You're not allowed to in any way be a whistleblower or complain or raise red flags because then you're being a murmurer. And those who murmur are apparently just as bad as Satan. If you raise a, a concern, no matter how genuine that concern may be, you're reminding Jehovah of Satan. How dare you? So, <laughs> this is a, an excellent example 
of of Watchtower in full Orwellian mode, just stifling any criticism whatsoever. And my question to Jehovah's Witnesses who may be watching this is, how can you have an organization fronted by leaders who claim to be imperfect and claim to be fallible and claim to be only human and therefore prone to making mistakes? How can you have it so that it's impossible to raise concerns when mistakes are made because let's face it they say that they are allowed to make mistakes and they say that they're imperfect but when do we see them apologizing and yet at the same time they want us to cut them some slack because they're imperfect and they're only human and so we should just be patient with them they aren't patient with the rank and file when it comes to administering discipline and judging people to the point of breaking apart families but they want the rank and file to be oh so forgiving of them and oh so patient with them while at the same time telling them you're not allowed to complain because complaining is murmuring murmuring is being like satan and we wouldn't want to be like satan so plenty to think about just with this particular video uh, if you happen to be a Jehovah's Witness. So I'm 37, 29. The righteous will possess the earth and they will live forever on it. Now this text was written after man had sinned and imperfection set in on the earth. And yet God says that the righteous will live forever on the earth. How can we be sure that God's purpose will not change? Because he tells us so. In Numbers 23, 19, he tells us that he determines what he determines he will carry out. So Jehovah will get at the root of the problem that we have. But how is he going to do that? Well, what would you do if you discovered that your house was infected with vermin? Would you burn your house down? No, you'll preserve your house, you need it. But you'll get rid of your problem. You'll get rid of the vermin. Many humans have failed to show appreciation and respect for God's gift to the earth. They've created the problem we have. They overload his systems with toxic matter, radioactive waste, undegradable materials, and so forth. In fact, I was just reading this past week that they went down to the very deepest parts of the Mariana Trench, that's the lowest part on the earth, miles below the surface of the waters, and they discovered garbage there, plastic bags, empty cans, wrappers. Because led by greed and selfishness, mankind has accept, upset the balance in nature. And Jehovah has vowed to remove to destroy, to bring to an end those ruining the earth. It states it plainly in Revelation 11:18, And he's going to do it before it's too late. He will not allow man to damage the earth so much that it will be impossible to repair it. This was a simply astonishing talk that was given at the 2019 Love Never Fails, ironically titled Love Never Fails Convention. I dealt with it uh, in more detail at the time. But this is a speaker at one of the assemblies and his talk was among those that appear on the video circulated by Watchtower for those who couldn't make it to the convention. So this is... Um, as you might be able to tell, an official Watchtower video, even though it's not one that you can just simply go on jw.org and watch. But what astonishing rhetoric. And by the way, after I made my video, I had people complaining that I was exaggerating. People were saying, oh, he's not saying that unbelievers are vermin. He's saying that those who ruin the earth are vermin. But in the context of the illustration, 
what he's saying is, what would you do if you had a house infested with vermin? Would you burn the house down or would you get rid of the vermin? Well, in the context of Armageddon and what the Armageddon teaching is, you're not telling me that the vermin, quote-unquote, are confined purely to people who are polluting or people who are ruining the earth. You then need to explain how the metaphor works in terms of this huge number, numbering billions, um, presumably, of people who aren't polluting the earth and also aren't Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, I'm sorry, for me, it was crystal clear when he was saying, if your house has vermin, do you burn the house down or do you get rid of the vermin? He, it's clear to me that he's talking about non-Jehovah's Witnesses. And what's happening here in this talk is non-Jehovah's Witnesses are being bundled together with basically anyone who is responsible for messing up the planet. And as I explained in my original video, how is he in any position to say that Jehovah's Witnesses have contributed in no way to, for example, plastic being in the ocean? Would he be willing to bet his life that not a single gram of plastic has found its way into the ocean that was that has passed through the hands of a Jehovah's Witness? I doubt it. I doubt he'd stake his life on that. But here he is, conveniently giving his religion a clean bill of health and blaming the problem on everyone else to the point of saying these people are vermin and need to be exterminated. And ironically, this vile, hateful rhetoric was disgorged from the platform of a convention that had the title Love Never Fails. Well, this is a very happy day for those who are very soon to graduate from this 147th class of Gilead. I wanted to begin by asking them a question, and that is, how far will you go? Well, now, when people ask that question, how far will you go, normally in connection with secular education, the, the meaning of the question is, well, are you going to get your bachelor's degree? Are you going to go for the, your master's? Are you going to go for a PhD and get your doctorate? And so in that sense, often going far in secular education is solely a means of self-fulfillment and not necessarily to help others. Some study what's called pure science, meant just to advance mankind's understanding of science, but with no practical benefit. Some study dead languages. Some study bacteria or insects which is wonderful if you like insects. <laughs> it may increase knowledge, but it doesn't necessarily help anyone. Well, divine education is so different. You see, it motivates us to ask the question, how far can I go, not to further myself, but to help others? Well, I think I would dispute that divine education is all about helping others. I think it's predominantly about helping an organization, specifically the leaders of that organization, of which Mark Sanderson here is one of them. And prior to seeing this clip, I mean, I know he's said some dodgy stuff, during his brief time as a governing body member. He was appointed, of course, in, I think, 2012. And for the most part, compared to other governing body members, he's one of the least, you could say, controversial governing body members. In fact, you could probably say he's one of, one of the more respectable governing body members, or at least that's how I look at him. I'm actually surprised that we don't see more of him on, for example, JW Broadcasting and in the various other videos that get produced, because, at least to me, he comes across as more credible. That said, I watch this video and I think, you're just as small-minded 
as your colleagues. Maybe they're rubbing off on you <laughs> in some way. Like you keep talking about bad association, spoiling useful habits. Well, maybe Tony Morris and Stephen Lett are spoiling Mark Sanderson's useful habits because what he is saying here in at the beginning of the uh, Gilead graduation, this, by the way, was taken from the December 2019 uh, JW Broadcasting episode, although it wasn't really an episode because it was just a recap of Gilead. But what he says here is just ridiculous. So he's saying that pursuing higher education is purely about self-fulfillment. It doesn't help other people. And he, he even talks there about PhDs. Well, if he were in a situation where his life was on the line, let's say due to a rare illness, you can bet he would be wanting the attention or the advice or the help of someone with a PhD. So as long as he isn't deriving benefit from individuals who spend years perfecting their knowledge in, in these areas then it's a total waste of time. But you can bet he would be changing his tune, or at least he would be distancing himself from this sort of thinking if he needed a PhD or someone with a PhD to come to his assistance due to a, a serious health problem. Let's say one that required expertise in bloodless medicine. So it's utter hypocrisy for him to be trying to shame people who better themselves in that way, saying, oh, they're, being, they're just being selfish. They just want self-fulfillment. It it's not about helping others. Nonsense. And then he goes on this incredible rant, first of all, talking about pure science. I had to actually Google pure science because I confess I've not heard of pure science before. The actual Google definition, if you type in pure science, is a science depending on deductions from demonstrated truths, such as mathematics or logic, or studied without regard to practical applications. So it sounds like study of the scientific method, so that you can, I don't know, apply the scientific method to various sciences without necessarily specialising in a particular science. That's what I take from it. It's not purely a mental exercise. It's something that is helping people understand how to reach conclusions, how to deduce conclusions based on, as it says there, demonstrated truths. That seems to me to be a perfectly legitimate field of study. But apparently, Mark Sanderson disapproves. Oh, dear. <laughs> and then he, then he has... This just blew me away. Some study dead languages. Is this the same Mark Sanderson who keeps pretending to be some kind of Bible scholar? <laughs> I've seen multiple videos of him particularly when they were putting together the exhibit at Warwick, the Bible exhibit, he was constantly talking about various Bible editions that they'd received or that they were looking for, many of which will have been written. I mean, Latin, for example, the Latin Vulgate. So apparently <laughs> it would be a mistake to be an expert in Latin because it's a dead language. But uh, don't push me on on whether it's okay to understand what's said in the Latin Vulgate. Honestly, the, the, he just hasn't thought it through at all, has he? There's, there are obvious applications for learning quote-unquote dead languages that aren't in common use today if it means that we learn more about history, if we learn more about where we came from. Indeed, if it means that we can advance Bible scholarship and learn more about the Bible and why it was written and who wrote it. 
But apparently, if it's not a language that people aren't speaking day to day, it's a dead language and it's a total waste of time. According to this total charlatan who parades himself round as some kind of Bible scholar when it suits him. Then he turns his attention to, I love this, he turns his attention to bacteria and insects as his example of something that would be a total waste of time to study. Some study bacteria or insects, which is wonderful if you like insects. <laughs> it may increase knowledge, but it doesn't necessarily help anyone. Probably you know this, because probably, <laughs> probably you're more educated. In fact, it's not inconceivable that many people watching this are more educated than Mark Sanderson. But f only 43% of the human body is human body cells. Only 43% of you watching this is human. The other 57% of cells in your body is bacteria. But apparently it's a total waste of time to study bacteria, even though <laughs> the colossal waste of oxygen and space, who is spouting this gibberish, He's literally saying this, oh, it would be a waste of time to study bacteria, when he is 57% composed of the stuff. So, of course, it's useful to study about bacteria, especially when it comes to, oh, I don't know, developing antibiotics that keep us alive. <laughs> I was watching thinking, you are an utter idiot. This is the first time. I mean, you, you can kind of excuse it when it's Stephen Lett because he comes across as being you know a little bit impaired if I can use that word anyway Mark Sanderson on the other hand hitherto has struck me as being relatively you know um, a full box of marbles or, or whatever you'd want to call it relatively with it and and all of that's just gone out the window now. Now that I've seen how, well, yeah, how stupid and idiotic he is. And let's <laughs> let's then talk about insects. Because he says some study bacteria and insects. And he says of insects, well, that's, that's wonderful if you like insects. And he gets a laugh for that. So why would you want to study insects? Well, I suppose it's wonderful if you like insects. Ha ha ha. Silly people studying insects. Um, he also says, it may increase knowledge, this is studying insects, but it doesn't necessarily help anyone. I'd like to read a quote to you. Um, and maybe you'll be able to guess where this quote comes from, but I'll confirm at the end. Insects play a vital role in our daily life. Indeed, about 30% of the foods we eat depend on pollination by bees, most of which are wild bees. But pollination is only one of the useful labours performed by insects. Insects keep the earth clean by means of an efficient recycling system as they process dead plants and animals. Thus, the soil is enriched, and nutrients that are liberated can make things grow. Without insects, writes entomologist Christopher O'Toole in his book Alien Empire, we would be inundated with dead plant and animal material. Wonderful if you like insects. It may increase knowledge, but it doesn't necessarily help anyone. Quoting Mark Sanderson. Well... <laughs> The quote I've just read is from The Awake 2000, January 8th, page 19. I think that says it all. We're at the point where they're so stupid and so idiotic 
that they freely contradict themselves if there is an agenda in play. And the agenda here, the agenda that Mark Sanderson is pursuing, even to the point of completely jettisoning whatever credibility he may have had left, the clear agenda is to dissuade witnesses from going through higher education to manipulate witnesses into thinking that it would be selfish to better oneself through higher learning, through going through university or college, when what they should really be doing is being selfless and thinking about others, specifically Mark Sanderson and his colleagues, specifically the governing body, and doing whatever the governing body wants people to do spending their time however the governing body wishes them to spend their time. And Mark Sanderson has the gall to talk about not being selfish. He's a total hypocrite. You might be dealing with a chronic or life-threatening illness, caring for a sick or elderly relative, grieving the death of a loved one, loneliness, a natural disaster, or maybe you're struggling with the devastating effects of past or present abuse. Now you firmly believe that God's kingdom will fix these problems, but that's in the future. What about today? By saying, stop being anxious, Jesus recognizes that anxiety is already in progress. He is very aware of our imperfect nature. He knows that we tend to bring our worries from yesterday, the would-haves, could-haves, and should-haves, and our imagined worries about tomorrow, the what-ifs, to today. But ask yourself, how often have I worried myself sick about what might happen tomorrow only to find that tomorrow wasn't nearly as bad as I feared it would be? Jesus also knows that anxiety can have real, sometimes painful consequences. It can stop us from making spiritual progress. What's the antidote? Let's consider four practical things we can do. First, rely on Jehovah and take one day at a time. So we need to add our second way to deal with anxiety. Pour your heart out to Jehovah in earnest prayer. Our third way to deal with anxiety is to read and meditate on God's Word. Let Jehovah speak to you. Allow Jehovah's thoughts to become your thoughts. Our fourth way to deal with anxiety is to share your feelings with a trusted friend. Proverbs 12, 25 says, Anxiety in a man's heart weighs it down, or as the footnote says, depresses him. But a good word cheers it up. A good word can come from a fellow believer who is motivated by God's Spirit and guided by His Word. So hopefully I don't need to explain why Ron Curzon's guide to mental health has made it onto my list of the worst 10 videos of 2019. It's absolutely shocking advice. We begin with him describing anxiety and being anxious as a sign of human imperfection. Oh, if you're being anxious, then you know, get over it. You need to dwell on Jesus' words and stop being anxious and then everything's going to be okay. That's his first piece of wisdom. And then he goes into this ridiculous list where witnesses are told to rely on Jehovah and take one day at a time. He keeps saying in the video, take one day at a time, as though it's as simple as just saying that if you are struggling with depression. Pour your heart out to Jehovah in earnest prayer. Oh, okay, that's going to fix things. Read and meditate on God's Word. Read the Bible more. And share your feelings with a trusted friend. And within seconds of saying that, it's clear that when he says trusted friend, he literally means someone who has Jehovah's Witness beliefs. 
not just any old person in the world, go to a fellow believer and confide in them. So he has this opportunity to point people in the direction of a mental health professional and nowhere throughout the entire speech and indeed throughout the entire episode does he actually do that. And that for me is an appalling omission. This advice doesn't just show how out of touch and ignorant Watchtower leaders are, bearing in mind Ron Curzon is a governing body helper and uh, on the teaching committee of the governing body. If you think about it, this sort of advice could potentially kill people. Because if you're suggesting... If your advice to people who are struggling with anxiety and depression excludes the the obvious path of consulting with a mental health professional, then if you think about it, you've got to bear at least some responsibility if they're only listening to you and if they end up con committing suicide because they're taking your advice. So this advice isn't just negligent and ignorant it's also potentially deadly. Eventually, showing love would call for even greater sacrifices. I'm so glad that I never gave up in learning to show love and that Jehovah never gave up on me. Now, when I see Carl, I have centuries of happy memories centuries of showing him and all of my brothers and sisters loyal love. So this was a dramatization that was shown on the final day of the Love Never Fails convention. And it shows a, an elder who feels bad because he hasn't been there for his friend when his friend got sick. So his friend Carl helped him become a witness. And then when Carl was stricken in hospital, uh, this guy, I forget what his name's supposed to be. It's irrelevant because he's a fictitious character. <laughs> but this guy is too busy doing his elder stuff to go and visit Carl in hospital. And then he obviously feels really bad when his friend dies. And then the whole thing switches to the Great Tribulation and the cops showing up and obviously shouting at him, interrogating him in his apartment, busting through the door, causing damage, taking him away, incarcerating him so he's there in a prison cell, presumably with other Jehovah's Witnesses. This is supposed to, I think we can fairly confidently say, depict the Great Tribulation. Because if you're watching this as someone who knows very little about Jehovah's Witnesses, they believe that not only is Armageddon coming, at which point everybody who doesn't share their beliefs will deserve to die, they also believe that in the run-up to this event, there will be what's known as the Great Tribulation, during which time there will be a series of events, including religion as a whole being outlawed, and finally 
involving their organization being sought after by the authorities so that Jehovah's Witnesses are being chased down and rounded up and thrown in jail cells. We saw this already graphically illustrated in the 2016 Remain Loyal to Jehovah Convention where a series of videos depicted a group of witnesses huddled together in a bunker waiting for the police to come and find them and that's why I named this by the way the bunker as a throwback to that particular series of videos and we see again another perfect example of what I've started to call persecution porn where Watchtower wants to agitate witnesses and make them feel as though the authorities are coming for them and when you think about Watchtower's agenda, this serves a clear purpose because it makes witnesses feel special. It makes them feel as though they are unique in some way. They are marked out for special attention because of their specific beliefs that nobody else has or no one has beliefs quite like theirs. The more Watchtower can convince witnesses not only that they are in line for this sort of treatment, but also that they're already experiencing this treatment, as we routinely see in videos that Watchtower makes about uh, Russia and that sort of thing. The more they can induce fear in witnesses, the more they can control them. Because if there's one tried and trusted way of manipulating people and controlling them to do what you want it's to create a bogeyman uh, make people terrified of that bogeyman and give them the solution as to how they can evade this bogeyman and the ultimate solution as we see there in the video is the paradise where this guy and his friend Carl are eventually reunited this paradise has been landscaped over billions of dead bodies of people who have been mown down men women and children all slaughtered for the crime of not being jehovah's witnesses which incidentally leads us nicely onto video number four now for a moment just reflect back on the hezekiah video that uh, we enjoyed during the convention season last year it was amazing, and what a beautiful job the brothers did in audio video, uh, depicting one angel that destroyed 185,000 men. It was spectacular. Uh, however, find Revelation chapter 17. These will battle with the Lamb, but because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, the Lamb will conquer them. Also, those with him who are called and chosen and faithful will do so. Now, as good as our brothers are in audio video, I personally doubt anyone could uh, do a videography and capture this event. Uh, you're talking about Christ Jesus, the 144,000 anointed, immortal spirit creatures, and then Jesus has the holy angels that are under his direction as king. This is going to be spectacular. All things are possible with God, but I think it would have to have him to be able to show a video to capture what's coming in the future. Just spectacular. Now, so it's as good as done. This is what's going to happen Regardless of how people view us when we preach this good news, because this is good news, the destruction of the world empire, false religion, the beginning of the great tribulation, this is spectacular news for God's people, and until it takes place, they won't believe it. But it will happen, because Jehovah says it's going to happen. So that'll be a time for us to prove our love for Jehovah God, will be the only group protected by him. So again, I've covered this already in a video, and I don't want to repeat myself too much, but suffice to say, what Tony's saying here becomes even more disturbing 
when you factor in Jehovah's Witness theology, specifically the fairly recent teaching or the fairly recent new light, that anointed ones will be gathered together to heaven before Armageddon strikes, essentially raptured, although they don't use the word rapture because of its embarrassing connotations and because probably because they've written articles against the whole concept of rapturing in the past. But essentially, Tony Morris and his colleagues will be, they believe, raptured to heaven before Armageddon strikes so that they can participate in the slaughter. And that's what makes the Jehovah's Witness theology, especially when it's coming out of their lips, particularly evil, because it's not just a case of followers or die. When it's coming from Tony Morris, what he's really saying is, followers or I'll kill you. He is relishing this spectacular slaughter at Armageddon, which he's saying couldn't... There's no way that the audio visual department could do justice to it. He gives the example of the scene in the Hezekiah drama from the 2016 convention where the angel swoops down and you just see these flashes of energy killing people. And he's saying, well, there's no way that the audiovisual department, as competent as they are, could ever do justice to the spectacle that we're in for at Armageddon. And again, he's saying this as someone who personally believes that he's going to be doing the slaying. He's going to be brandishing the sword when that happens. So there's a real bloodlust, I think, um, in this man. And I've speculated before about the extent to which his experience in Vietnam seems to factor into his bloodlust because he obviously famously spoke of human hot dogs, um, charred remains uh, that he saw after a helicopter crash in Vietnam, and how he anticipates this being a, a common spectacle at Armageddon. So it wouldn't surprise me if there's some PTSD there from his experiences in Vietnam. I think he was a medic at a particular army base. I'm not sure. I don't think he was on the front line. I could be wrong. He hasn't really given as many details to go on. But I think that his experience probably, in a, in a rather disturbing way, informs his theology. So if you think about it, millions of witnesses are worse off because of this man's inability to deal with his PTSD, which he is then projecting onto millions of witnesses through the teachings that he is um, perpetuating, particularly when it comes to Armageddon and the extent to which it will result in death, which he apparently relishes. Just prior to my baptism, unfortunately, I became critically ill. I was eventually told I had two hours to live. The doctors insisted that I have a blood transfusion, and I took my stand. There was no question that I was willing to die for Jehovah. But the question to me was, was I willing to live for him? And I became all the more determined to use my life to serve Jehovah. So obviously I lived. <laughs> um, it motivated me to really be focused on the ministry. I began regular pioneering when I was 17. It's been a privilege to study with people who were Baptist and Catholics and Methodist, Episcopalians. Some were atheist, some were rich, some were poor. So we've just been watching part of a brief segment that appeared during the public address at the Love Never Fails convention. The public address was an hour-long video presented by Ron Curzon. In a, in a rather tedious way, it basically went around the world. Ron was having these Skype conversations with various um, people from branches around the world. A lot of it was very, very tedious. But one part that really stood out was this story from Sally Giltin, and particularly that part of the story that we've just been listening to. She says that 
she faced the blood issue and she survived but she says that she there was no question that she was willing to die for Jehovah now hopefully I don't need to explain why that's incredibly disturbing language but that's precisely the mentality you have as a Jehovah's Witness particularly when it comes to the prospect of losing your life through refusing blood you consider it a display of loyalty so that if you were to die you would be dying for Jehovah as she puts it but it's also even more disturbing when you think of how young she must have been when she made this decision because she mentions that this was before she got baptized and then later she mentions that she began pioneering when she was 17 you cannot pioneer unless you are baptized which means that she was at least just turned 17 or possibly 16 when this medical calamity happened I mean honestly she could have been far younger because there are examples in the literature of witnesses being baptized as young as seven or eight so there's really no telling how young she was but it's almost certain that she would have been a minor and yet she is boasting almost of the fact that she was willing to lay down her life for her beliefs which is obviously very disturbing especially when that particular message is finding its way into a propaganda video that's being shown to millions of Jehovah's Witnesses including their children if your brother or your son or your daughter or your cherished wife or closest companion should try to entice you in secrecy, saying, let us go and serve other gods? You must not give in to him or listen to him, nor should you show pity or feel compassion or protect him. Instead, you should kill him without fail. Once we cleanse the land of Judah, we'll head north again to the cities of Samaria. So we've just been watching part of the drama that was shown at the, again, ironically titled Love Never Fails convention, in which Watchtower depicts the cleansing of the land of Judah by King Josiah of all false worship. And the way this is depicted, well, again, I discussed all this in my video by all means check it out if you haven't already seen it because again I don't want to repeat myself too much this is really more of a summary but there are quite disturbing echoes of what we were seeing in Syria and Iraq at the time of the ISIS occupation we see more or less that same behavior here only it's apparently okay because it's Josiah acting on behalf of Jehovah due to the fact that the book of Deuteronomy has miraculously appeared <laughs> during temple renovations, giving Josiah a license 
to not just end false worship in Judah, but also hunt down Baal worshippers and kill them. And this is done with relish here. And as I point out in my original rebuttal, it's almost as though the governing body are vicariously living out their fantasy of what they would do if they had the power and will do in their minds one day when they do have the power. When Jared was in the hospital, Child Protection Services did investigate us. They were concerned there was negligence. It was just adding to the pain. The way it turned out, they backed completely away from that. They realized we hadn't been negligent. Uh, so as we faced different situations, we'd pray at the time. Uh, and someone would come or they would say something and they fed us. Uh, the brother made a schedule and he said, you're gonna feed these friends. And the brother's instructions were, you don't bring it and just drop the food. You stay with those friends. It he died in June of 1992. Uh, he was at home. Uh, and the last thing he said to us was, work hard so we can all be together again. How encouraging to know that Gary and Beth are able to take vacation time to travel occasionally to see their daughter and her husband, who are also serving in the traveling work. Can there be any doubt that Jehovah was answering their prayers? Doesn't that strengthen our conviction that Jehovah will also answer Jared's prayer that they all will be together again? No. Jehovah didn't miraculously cure Jared. But through his endurance and strong faith, Jared gives a witness to the universe that even a child that trusts in Jehovah can prove his loyalty to death. Now, other situations may turn out differently and not end up in death. If an individual feels that relief was because of Jehovah's intervention, he should certainly give thanks. However, we must recognize that Jehovah knows the best way to handle matters so that it results in honor to his name and to the lasting good of his servants. Again, I don't want to repeat myself too much. I did do a video on this horrendous material titled The Martyrdom of Jared Scepter, in which I shared my full thoughts on this appalling celebration of what amounts to the murder of a child. Not only was this the worst video of 2019, I would go so far as to say that this is the worst video that Watchtower has ever produced. Because up to this point, I think this was the August 2019 JW Broadcasting episode, if I remember correctly. Up to this point, Watchtower had been very careful to keep the blood issue for the most part, out of its JW Broadcasting episodes and out of its glossy, highly produced convention videos, mostly ignoring that altogether, which was very wise if you think about it, because it's the most controversial or one of the most controversial things about the religion is the fact that not only do they manipulate adults, to die rather than accept blood. They also expect the same thing of minors, of children, even though clearly minors and children aren't in a position to know what their religious beliefs will be when they are eventually adults, and they're just going to go along with whatever their parents tell them. This has always been a clearly untenable teaching that Watchtower enforces on their followers and their followers' children, 
So it was understandable in a way that they kept this for so long out of their highly produced video material. But obviously, eventually, it bubbles up to the surface. So that here in the August 2019 broadcast, you have this celebration of Jared Scepter dying. And I don't think I mentioned this in my original reaction video, but Jared would have been my age if he'd survived. He should be with us today. And it's frankly a crime that he isn't. And how dare Watchtower revel in his death as they do in this video. I was gobsmacked at the attitude of the parents in talking all about their own feelings. And, oh, well, we were we were well fed through the whole thing. The brothers and sisters brought us food. And they were under strict orders to stick around and provide encouragement rather than simply leaving the food. Wasn't that marvellous? No. This is your takeaway from that whole experience, that, that people brought you food? That's what you're remembering from that time you murdered your child the fact that your bellies were full. They talk about all this, and then we switch to Gary Bro, astonishingly focusing on the fact that this couple are now Circuit Overseer and Circuit Overseer's wife and able to visit their surviving child. Who The surviving child is also in the circuit work, and this somehow makes it all, you know, positive, a happy ending. And Gary Bro's comments there as well saying, well, of course, whether someone lives or dies, it's all part of Jehovah's plan. As long as it's bringing him praise, and according to his will, then everything's fine. I would challenge any Jehovah's Witness to spend time thinking about what Gary Bro is saying there. Because it's having it both ways. It's saying if Jared had lived we'd still be making a video and talking about how Jehovah intervened and saved him through the doctors. But he died, so instead we're making a video about how Jehovah strengthened his parents and helped them to endure. Having it both ways in the most deplorable way, and I shudder to think what the full body count is, of this appalling teaching, they are willing to literally kill people rather than do a U-turn, rather than show any weakness. And as I've said before, if you think about it, once they've drawn first blood, then it becomes irreversible. Because they can't then go back and say, actually, maybe we made a mistake, you can receive blood, without acknowledging that they are responsible for, I think it's been estimated, tens of thousands of deaths, one of whom is featured right here. And his death is being celebrated by the organisation that killed him. So we must never forget Jared Scepter. That's a name that I'm going to continue talking about because as tragic as his story is, at least we get to give it meaning and give his death some kind of meaning, if only to warn people about this horrendous organisation and what it's doing to people. But anyway, those were my 10 worst videos of 2019. I'm sure you'll agree. I had no shortage of things to talk about. Goodness knows what's in store for 2020. Every time I think Watchtower couldn't possibly get worse with its material. Oh, they couldn't possibly say this, or they couldn't possibly depict that. They just go ahead and do it because they're deluded and they always put their own interests and their own agenda first. So goodness knows what's in store for the next 12 months. But those were my thoughts on the worst videos of 2019. All that remains is to wish you all a very happy holidays, Merry Christmas, and a Happy New Year. Don't forget to subscribe to the John Cedars channel for more such videos. And as always, thank you for watching.